So um, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to um, open this seminar dedicated to an important figure, uh, the Finnish architect Reima Pietilä, Prey Reima Pietilä, um, to celebrate the centenary of his birth. And of course, first of all, I want to thank you for coming, coming here to our temporary uh, venue, the new uh, temporary villa for next two years when Villa Lante is undergoing uh, renovation work. So uh, a warm welcome to this, uh, uh, this house, Casino Pentagonale, that used to be the botan part of the botanical gardens of the Sapienza University. So also a historical and interesting building. Um, I want to especially thank Antonello Alici for the idea of this seminar, or for, for the organization. And this seminar uh, fits so well under the umbrella of our Nordic November. So this uh, sort of festival dedicate, dedicated to Nordic culture, which is also already the second edition this year, whole month of uh, events that have something to do with Scandinavian countries, the North, organized by the four embassies of the northern countries and also the four, four uh, research institutes. So, um, architect Reima Pietila was an exceptional figure in Finnish architecture and he's renowned, renowned not only for, for his uh, architectural production but also for theoretical and philosophical writings and educational work. Uh, in this seminar we will have three experts uh, scholars who will discuss his work from diverse perspectives uh, with the aim of mapping Pietila's relational geography between Finland and Italy. So it's, it's perfect for our Nordic November, bringing a little bit of nor northern culture to Rome and tracing, finding the traces of, of Nordic artists and architects in Rome. Um, our Finnish Institute is, focalizes its activities on humanistic research, and our emphasis is on history, art history, archaeology, and classical philology. Uh, however, also architecture has always played an important role uh, among our disciplines. So we organize a course for young Finnish students of architecture, uh, and also we have, since the beginning, organized many important uh, presentations and talks on, on the theme of, it, in particular, Finnish architecture. Um, I checked through the years about the, the presentations that have been held on these topics, and I found that in 1964, for example, Paolo Portoghesi gave a lecture with the title Il Significato delle Opere di Alvaralto. And 70s and 80s, the director Henrik Lilius gave several talks about Finnish architecture. And in 1994, there has been Gaia Remidi giving a lecture with the title Alvar Alto, Un ritratto dell'artista da giovane. And last but not least, Antonello Alici in 2019 gave a talk about the uh, architecture of libraries in Finland. Um, and with this, I say that I would think that after so much Alvar Aalto, it's time also to talk about Reima Pietila, who is another very important figure of Finnish architecture. And so um, I, I give the floor to, to our three speakers, of which the first one is Professor Roger Kona, who is a prolific researcher and writer. He um, is just to mention one work, author of the award-winning volume, Writing Architecture, uh, published in 1989. He has also produced numerous exhibitions and films on architecture, art, material culture during his long international career. He currently holds the international chair at Avani Institute of Design, Kalikut, uh, Kerala, India. His joint alternative architecture practice Heron Maisy won the first prize in the White House Redux competition in 2008. 
and he worked with and alongside Reima Pietila from 1974 to uh, the death of, of the architect in 1993. And uh, in fact, before giving the word to Professor Kona, uh, I would like to call forth uh, Aino uh, Niskanen, who is the second speaker and has a word of salutation, I think, to inaugurate the, the evening. So please, please, I know, with a, with a salute. And then we pass to Professor Kona. Yes, th thank you both Antonio Loalici and of course people here at Villa Lante for uh, organizing this seminar. It's great and it's worthwhile to celebrate uh, Reima Pietile architect, philosopher, and futurist, all the three different things. Uh, the uh, hun uh, hundred years jubilee, because he was born 1923 and uh, died exactly on his 70th birthday, dramatically, 1993. He was a unique phenomenon in the field of Finnish and international architecture because of his experimental works. His theoretical, philosophical writings and also as a teacher important. He differed from the often pragmatic Finnish climate or the circles around Alvaralto. That at times he had very little work in Finland. It's a small country, yet there are not uh, always space for diversity. Even if his early works, such as the Brussels World Fair Pavilion 1958 or the Kaleva Church 19, uh, uh, late 1950s were widely known. Luckily, during his silent years, he had lively contacts with the international colleagues and some important international work too. And these silent year years without big commissions uh, made it possible for him to develop his ideas and his writings. His writings questioned the rationalism of, it, of the time and maybe the rationalism also of today. I think they are very up to date even today. Thank you. And with this salute, um, I give the word to Professor Kona, who will uh, give the first talk. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, it's loud and clear. Um, I think thank you very much for inviting me there. And to those sitting there, I wish you a good, good evening. Um, this is, an, this is an extraordinary collection, really, of three people because we, we represent three stages of research that's possible um, when we look at uh, architecture today. And you'll see my title says Critical Forensics and Research Methodology. I say that on purpose because forensics I use in the way that um, uh, Sassia, uh, an Italian um, writer who wrote on the, uh, the death of Aldo Mori and also spoke about the forensics, or the language forensics, and Pasolini. And there is a connection here because Pietola was an inveterate, let us say, creative linguist. And he used language as a way to chart territory that wasn't always considered architecture. So that's why I'm using the term critical forensics and I'm partnering that, that with research methodology because we're in a stage in architecture at the moment, some of you will be in the academy, some of you may be in practice, but we have lost a grip on, on um, to some extent, critical thinking through an individual that doesn't mean to say a celebration like a monograph, but the, the use of an individual to explore how the architecture was created. 
And this is why uh, we're looking today at Pietala. And just before I just move on now, uh, just explain the title, Inside the Outsider. Aino has indicated well his difference and his um, diversity. But, and she also mentioned silent years. His works were known in the time he did them, but not in the way, for example, you have heard about Alvar Aalto. Italian architects knew more about um, Alvar Aalto for obvious reasons. They had Italian researchers working and even people working in Aalto's office. But Pietola remained some, somewhat on the outside. But we say inside the outsider because Pietola was one that actually wrote and commented an enormous amount about the architecture in a way from the outside. And we will, we will look into that as we go on. There are three things that I would like to bring attention today, which will also be, I think, echoed by the two other speakers. One is, what is the contemporary archive today? The second is, what is a mental geography? And the third thing is, what is an architectural repertoire? The first, a contemporary archive. Bear with me as I just read this, because I th then we'll go into examples. These are questions for all of you sitting there, some of you researchers, some of you not. But they're clear, qu clear questions we can pose to each other. Do we rewrite histories to understand the loans made from one work to another, from one architect to another, from one era to another? Are we facing the collapse of all architecture inside all other architecture? Whatever, interpre whatever interpretations we have been encouraged to make, can we offer a different critical forensics to study an architecture works? That is the, the, the program, in a way, I'm setting out to share with you, not for me to make the... Uh, the statement that this is the way to do it, but to share with you, because people like I know who will speak next, and Antonello who will speak third, are in the stage where they are taking over where this sort of work can go. So I speak about Pietro's mental geography first. These are the, the front and the back cover of the book that was just mentioned in the introduction, uh, called Writing Architecture. Uh, it's called Writing Architecture for a reason. Because for Pietula, language could also be something that could be assessed as architecture. It had forms, it had shape, it had a morphology. Uh, you're familiar in, in, in Italian with morphologia. It, it's, it's a common term. It was a term that Pietula uh, explored in the 50s and 60s um, with his interest in linguistics and language. And one of the things that comes to mind immediately, and some of you may ask this question, is why did Pietro involve himself so much in the English language? Well, when I joined Pietro in 1974, I already knew that he had an archive, an immense archive of correspondence and letters from 19, well, from the early 1960s right through the decade to different architects abroad. He was always seeking some sort of contact. That didn't mean to say he was seeking a way to agree with someone else or to see that his architecture was the same as someone else, but he wanted the dialogue. And the dialogue of ideas was what really set Pietrela off in the 60s and was reinforced in the 1970s. You'll see the front cover of this book and the back cover of this book. In the middle, you'll see an image of Pietrela, which I will refer to at the end of this short, short talk. And in the back cover, you'll see a picture of Pietrela almost as if he's a mathematician, writing what appears to be formulas 
but they're not just formulas. Piatilla was consistently diagrammatic, and we use the word diagram in the wider sense of the world. He could diagram out language or space or speech, and he would draw it out. Um, it didn't mean to say it would lead immediately to a form or an architecture. It was the way he was thinking. So that's the, the, the left and the right side. Uh, Around this uh, left-hand page, you'll see images. And these images act as a sort of frame within which Peter's work was always operating. And I'll, li I'll list what these are because they're in a way a clue, not only to the book inside, but the clue to an architect who maybe has done various works, but those works provide a background for the next works. So they're always part of the stream of consciousness and the mind and the brain bringing s some things up and some things remain low. As if we, if we look at Antonio Damasio's latest book on, on mind and feeling, then we look at not only visual images, but patterns, patterning it, uh, of images, which make a patterning set. And Peter, uh, was quite conscious of that, and he he um, demonstrated that in his notebooks. The left-hand side, you'll see a little um, uh, sketch, which is Fantomas. Um, that's from his school uh, time, when he was 14, 15, and he was making a comic strip around Fantomas. Some of you may know Fantomas from the Belgian-French a uh, detective writer. Fantomas was a, a character who committed a crime but left always left a sign there, a glove or something there that that the the crime had been committed and he moved on. Pietela was very interested in the in the narrative. So in this little school book, there's little small stories, a, a little bit between a comic book and a narrative book. Underneath, you'll see a very small sketch of a man going forward in, in the war. That is a sketch when he's in the trenches in the Winter War in Finland in 1939 and 40, when he was, he, he was born in 23. So he would only have been 17, 18 when he was uh, called up to go to the war. Didn't stay for the whole time, but was back. So this is part of his background. And this, as we go to the top left-hand side, you'll see a plan. That is a plan of Dipoli. Uh, I won't mention the different words because you can all refer to these. You can go to books. You can look at these. But what I am trying to indicate is the, the geography within which he worked. Now, this, this in a way, is his own geography. But at the side, to the to the... Uh, at the top, to the right-hand side, you'll see these little um, diagrams. Uh, Pietela was unusual in that he he began diagramming uh, in the mid-50s, and then the late 1950s, um, he did an exhibition called Urbanism and Morpholo Morphology, Urbanismi Morphologia. Uh, these, as I know, has indicated many of these are, are why we, we might give him the name of, of a futurist, not in the, in the Santalia type, but a futurist in terms of looking at the future. He was already looking at landscape and landscape shapes and the consciousness of landscapes. So in a way, he was uh, already looking at the mental maps that came in the 1970s with geographers like um, White and Gould, who wrote their seminal book on mental maps in 1974. On the right-hand side, you'll see an image of um, the executioner, the books from uh, Fantomas, uh, a sketch in the middle, and then uh, uh, a finished artwork from Hugo Simberi on the right-hand side at the bottom right, um, entrance into Hades, uh, which uh, 
was always, that wasn't necessarily always on Peter's mind, but he was immersed also within the art around the culture at the time. The bottom is a small sketch done during wartime, and the left hand, bottom left, is, is probably what I, what I think is one of the most remarkable buildings that was never built, which is the Monte Carlo um, uh, multi, uh, multifunction center. Uh, the reason why I say that, not because of the expressionist sketch, which is remarkable in its own way, but because it was a, a building in 1969 that had such, um, I would say, elegant complexity of moving parts, which would have been quite a, quite, um, a prototype had it been built. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at the time, given the type of uh, climate architecture was in, Archigram won the competition, and Pietela came second in that. So, what I'm showing there is a framing of Pietela's work, uh, and you can imagine these these images would change all the time. So it's almost like um, a suggestion for a digital digital projection while he's drawing and all these things are coming back which which takes us over to the right hand side which is the back cover of the building which really repeats repeats the idea of uh, of the front cover except it it starts to bring out Peter's interest in in uh, literature and culture and art in other ways one of a conversation we had um, in 1974-75 concerned Samuel Beckett, which is up there on the right-hand side on Attendant Godot, uh, waiting for Godot in English, Beckett wrote. Uh, we always questioned this because we, we often had these conversations. In Finnish it was translated, those of you sitting there who know Finnish, Kuomena Han Tule meaning tomorrow he comes. We know that's a line in the play, tomorrow Godot comes, but it wasn't the title of the play. And we often discussed this uh, in, a, in, a, in a playful way, but underneath quite a seriousness, that tomorrow architecture would come. It wasn't quite there yet, but it would come. So that is setting up the... Uh, the I, I put this because I think all architects have a mental geography, uh, we haven't always studied a mental geography. We've actually tr often tried to keep to keep the architect to known histories, accepted histories, and accepted theories, which try to explain the work. I think we can we can divorce from that these days, and we can look at the mental geography, which tells us how an architect was connected at the time, and how possibly, just as I know suggested. Pietzler might be more relevant to today than we, than we realized, than the Finns realized, than we, anyone realizes. But again, that will come back to how the archive is used. There's one other thing that I wanted to mention here before moving on quickly. Uh, that image underneath everything is called the littoral. It is the space where water comes in and meets the land. It is a, a cipher, a metaphor for the way Pietela designed. The water is never still. Uh, the space, the, the, the land that's, that's dry is never totally dry. So there's a zone within where the water meets the land, which is always wet and always dry, but it's always in constant change. That fluidity, and it was a complexity that Pietela was very conscious as he tried to control it, that fluidity made up many of the ideas that came into the buildings. Um, sorry, the the screen has frozen a little bit, so it's gone. It's gone. Um, it's gone. There. So now I want to ask you, uh, for all of you, and it's something that we can discuss depending on time. If, there, if, there, if there's a mental geography, what is an architectural repertoire? 
Are we reasonable in thinking that this is something that can help us understand an architect? So in other words, how and why does the Finnish architect Rema Piertola, known from the 20th century, make us think today? It's interpretive research. We have to interpret things. Uh, we can take things from existing books. We can take things uh, written about Pieter existing. But how do we assess them? How do you sitting out there assess them? How do researchers assess them? For example, how did he start an idea? How did he develop it? And form architecture out of a dialogue with other words or works. This is operative research. The difference is that Pietro is always operating within architecture as a dialogue. To understand that, we need to really understand the mental geography behind his work and what build up, built up a repertoire. If we can do that, and if we can bring something new to the field, then we might be able to look at why Pietro is authentic, relevant, and why he was an exception. I have uh, just said, uh, quickly gone over those um, figures, and I'm not going to uh, labor this point much longer, because there are the 20 aspects of that front cover, which really uh, are a key or a cipher to, Pietula's, to the way Pietula op occupied and dwelt and participated in world ideas. So it's an image mapping, but remembering what um, uh, it, it, it's fruitful to think today what uh, Antonio Damasio says about image mapping, that images are not always visual, but they're a patterning, and a patterning made of sensory information, tactile, perhaps, smell, and so on. This was very ob clearly part of Pieter's, we, we, we call the term synesthesia, but this was part of, a, of an overall uh, sensing that Pietola actually did towards his uh, work. Now, <clears throat> as some of you might go on, some of you, as I said, maybe re researchers, um, and we might have time to discuss this a little bit later, um, what is a mapping today? What is a synchronic and what is a diachronic model? Well, diachronic, from its word, diachronos, is across time. As you'll see in that image above, these are, these are pages from, a, from a, um, an atlas of transformation that I did in the book, Writing Architecture, which showed how Pieter's work changed over year by year. You'll see the year at the top, and relevant to this is international, and I'm not calling them influences, international world uh, is at the top, and the bottom was the Finnish cultural world. And it's something that not everyone uh, maybe can attempt this until you have a certain knowledge of, of the person. I was very lucky to be able to be with Pietler and actually share these these interests and we could share together certain um, global interests like um, you know the work of John Cage where we would discuss where he would discuss the, the notion of silence in John Cage and how uh, diagrammatically he could he would make a difference between John Cage and Stockhausen for example um, and I don't want to make a big thing out of this except that he was constantly configuring in his mind the way this would turn out into a form and a line and use, use line in different ways. So that's the diachronic model. The synchronic model is the vertical line. Um, and that is synchro synchronic. What happens in a certain year? So you'll see on the right-hand side is a synchronic line from 1951. And I put at 1951, the world culture, in a way, was involved with Schoenberg, 
André Gide, Wittgenstein, Stockhausen, Sartre, Philip Guston, Beckett, UNESCO, and, uh, and uh, New Newman. Uh, now, the amount Pietrelli knew about these things is not a question. We're not trying to give a quantum to that. That's not a quantitative thing. It's, it was, this was a community of ideas around which he could test his own ideas. I have not come across many architects who have this um, width. I'm sure there are, and I'm sure there are many who, who could be put under this type of forensic study. But it's certainly extremely interesting. And if we come down to, to the bottom, we'll see other works, which is, um, uh, even, even I can't read it, in, uh, but it, it, Harviko and Vitika, uh, there are people there who, for example, uh, Jacques Vitika at the bottom did the uh, play uh, of Beckett's Waiting for Godot in Helsinki. So Pietro was aware of these things and, and and you'll see the architect that was coming out in 1951 was quite interesting, quite uh, quite an interesting development of, of these sketch forms, which were not built, but early ideas. And you'll see how that first... So what I'm asking in this research and, and, and as, as a research idea is, what community I, of ideas did he belong to in the 20th century that we can research and find important today. And this brings me on to, um, I know the next speaker and Antonello, because uh, I just want to make a point here. We have three stages of research presented here, and we can, we can look at it, and they're all relevant. One of us is not more relevant than the other. I have a first-hand experience. We call it first-hand. Okay, I was with the architect, sat with him, talked with him, traveled with him, dr drank a whiskey with him, and so on. It's first-hand knowledge. It allows me to make these structures and make this mental geography, but it doesn't mean to say it's the only thing and it explains everything. The second-order knowledge is someone like I know who comes in, who wasn't working in the office, but it was around at the time, and she's has the cultural background and the language background and has seen Pietula emerge over the years and brings her own um, view and research to that and sees how important Team 10 might be, uh, etc. She can research in, an, in a different way. Then we've got Antonello who comes in as, in a way, third hand. He doesn't know Pietula, hasn't met Pietula, but... He has a, a geography, a mental reach to look at the wider issues. For example, why Pietula from 1957 onwards occasioned an interest by Italians, especially Bruno Zerbi, who was very interested in this young architect. And uh, Zerbi, as some of you sitting there will know, Zerbi was very much interested in this, the expressionist <coughs> The, the freer form of architecture. And I have to say, Zevi remained constant in contacting Pietula, in passing on Pietula's information to other Italians, uh, passing it on to Giancarlo De Carlo uh, when he wrote. So Antonello gives us an access, but it gives us a deeper way of looking at this, at this contact. So, uh, I'm, I'm closing towards the end now so that uh, we can move on. So, to some, Pietro was the ultimate fit, quiet, detached, and different. Can we even say he was more international and more connected than many of his colleagues? Why would we want to say that? And how would we say it? Does that make him uh, more special? Well, not necessarily more special, but as I've tried to show you, it does make his relationship to architectural ideas both committed to the culture in Finland in, in terms of language and landscape, but also to ideas that he knew was going on out of the, the country. 
Was he a scriptomaniac? Scriptomania is a useful term because we usually don't use it for architects. But in fact, it's perfectly relevant for someone like Peter. He wrote, drew lines, and thought architecture continuously. You can put this the other way around. Nothing was not architecture. Food. We could look at food. We could look at collecting food or mushrooms, and that would become architecture. The way he could translate this was his own. I'm not saying that we can make a pattern book out of this and suddenly um, know how to how to interpret that. But you can all take you know you 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 just need to look at broccoli compared with a mushroom and look at the forms and the shape and the morphology of those two vegetables and they'll give you completely different forms. But I could relate them both. To Peter's architecture and the way he he um, planned some of the things. Um, I particularly like this bottom drawing, this drawing on the bottom right, which was um, called Hollow and Bump. So there's a hollow in the landscape, which, and then there's a there's a bump. Uh, it's particularly inventive. It doesn't give you any particular answers, but it shows you, as I said, the pattern of the imagery that was working within Peter's uh, mind. In a way, that's the mushroom. On the left, just be next to the picture of uh, Riley Peter leaning on her hand, on the left is a drawing that comes out of Zurich, I think, um, or, or, or Oulu uh, Planning uh, University. And it was, I, I, I call it my brother, broccoli drawing. Peterle didn't call, call it the broccoli drawing, but I call it that because of the stems and the way the rectilinear tube meets the unformed or the irregular, which is a binary that you'll find in many, many Peterle works. The binary of the um, non-rectilinear will, will clash at some stage with the rectilinear. And uh, the Dipoli building in 1996 was a classic example of, of that. Um, the reason why uh, the bottom drawing, and then I'm, I'll move on quickly now, the bottom drawing uh, is a sketch, two sketches of the New Delhi Embassy, which was won in competition in 1962, but was uh, got uh, awarded first prize, but then was hijacked by the ambassador. Uh, so wasn't awarded, and then was re-awarded in, in the early 1980s and built and completed in 1986 in Delhi. But I put it there because it, it has the, the stem. It reminds me of the broccoli drawing. It reminds me of the idea of how the stem move, moves into a, another form. And so that little sketch in turquoise on the left, in a way, for me, is a kernel for, this, for the building there. So um, we will move on, and I will uh, move to the end. What is the relevance of this one picture uh, in the middle of the front cover of my book? Well, I've already shown you an image surrounded by uh, imagery. But uh, one can never forget Peter's humor. He, he was... Well, certainly in private and certainly close up with me, a very had a uh, an exquisite humour, but it was very very understated. It wasn't necessarily dry. It was understated. He didn't laugh out loud or anything like that. But he found he found um, uh, comfort in the small quirky things. And he used to wear these hats, and uh, you know, became a little bit of a uh, a figure that some some uh, referred to him as uh, a shaman and uh, would refer to mythology in in um, in uh, Finnish mythology, which I know would would know much better than, than I. But he wore this little cap called a kalotti, and he was he was always wearing it. But for some reason, to this event where he'd gone in a in a dressed up tweed jacket which he didn't wear very often. Uh, and someone said to him that, Mr. Peterler, why have you not got your hat on? 
So uh, whilst other people were talking, he just cut this out of a piece of A4, folded it, and made his hat, which he hadn't brought. So uh, this is a, a also um, this is also a cipher for his difference. His the notion of the exception within the familiar, setting himself within, but also apart from the myths of Finnish identity, Finnishness, and rationalism. Pietula constantly contested, diverged from, yet played within the promoted ideology of a limited but dominant circle of Finnish architects. I think Aino was pointing at this, and it's something that uh, can still bear, bear some um, more forensics. Inside the outsider in Finnish architecture. So, outside. Pietula was often seen as an outsider in Finland, while his repertoire, his affinities to ideas, form, and works were always in dialogue with the world beyond Finland. There's not a paradox there. Um, it just so happens that he constantly improved and worked in English, and certainly whilst I was there, uh, he, he would write directly in English, uh, he would sometimes write in Finnish, but he would write directly in English, and we would play with the corrections. He was never someone who could write it out and say, that's it. He would play with the corrections, and any corrections in certain vocabulary would lead to other ways of opening the dialogue. This, this I think, made him extraordinary. And any of you who know anything about Alto, Alvar Alto, for example, which was mentioned at the beginning, who, who was mentioned at the beginning, will know that Alto did not work this way. Inside, why is he inside? Well, for him to work inside, it became for him an operative paradox. And I want to explain that paradox because works seemingly embedded in the Finnish landscape and language and we can use the language and the landscape to explain some of the works. But he also used these as operative, uh, operative tools, that means for design thinking. And these were also in dialogue with ideas and architecture developing elsewhere. So the notion of having an, a, a debate with, with uh, Bruno Zervi, or later with John Hayduck, or later with um, the Hungarian architect Imre Makovic were all uh, tools for his own design thinking to move around it. But he, it was not that he was comparing himself with these uh, works, but they were, they were clearly operative. So that's why I wanted to make the difference between the interpretive level of research, which will go on all the time, and opening us up to mapping Pietler into the operative. How did he work? How did he gain his interest and move ideas into different forms? The last uh, slide for you all, and this is really addressed to all of you sitting there or the, those who will eventually uh, listen to this, because we do need to move architectural research and methodology on in some way, beyond the accepted histories the accepted theories which we often learn from the 20th century to bring into this century to say that this person was relevant. I think Pietler offers a completely new picture of looking at this if we use this type of forensics. So the question, what gets lost critically when we try to breathe and understand ideas and ideologies distorted and lost long ago? For example, we don't use the word expressionism or organic architecture very much today. If we do use it, is that enough to situate someone when the language has already moved on into another um, realm? I would suggest we have to rethink this. Two, do we rewrite histories to understand the loans made from one work to another? I said that at the beginning. From one thinker to another from one era to another. 
There is nothing to say that a Pietula building from 1959 has not relevance in 2023. Whatever the amount of parametric work that goes on, These works can show a, a geography and a way of working within the present as much as we know more about the past. Three, are we facing the collapse of all architecture inside all other architecture? Why do I say this? Whatever interpretations, translations we make, are we satisfied with those? Are we satisfied to bring them and, and collapse it all inside other architecture? And yet, when we look at what's happening, certainly in British architecture today, and in the parametric and the, the role of icons and all these things, um, sometimes you can look at certain things on Art Daily and all sorts of um, websites that you find it hard to differentiate where the architecture is coming from, where it's going, and so is that a reality? And what does it mean if, if that is a re reality? A question to, final question to every one of us, how can we be true to the immediacy of the cover, current moment, which is now, and situate an archive from the past? I began with uh, Leonardo um, Sassia and his work on Mori and his work on Pasolini. The same thing if you're not an architect, if you're a literary scholar, the th same thing would be relevant right now. How do we work these figures, the configurations and the mental geographies now from the past? moving into the future. I have three recommendations uh, for any of those of you interested in reading, and a lot of our reading in, in contemporary research methodology now in architecture, I would suggest, comes beyond architecture. And it so happens that these three works are Italian, which I think some of you will know. I do recommend a book called The World Republic of Letters. It is a book by Pascal Casanova, and it talks about the fields of geography of literary movements around the world, and I think it has relevance to the way we might look at architecture and its mental geographies. The second book is by Franco Moretti, and it's called Distant Readings, and Moretti sets up geographies of readings across the globe and he interrelates literary readings in different parts of the world and doesn't stay within nationalities. That's a very interesting um, direction which we could take in architecture. Maybe some people are already taking it. And the final uh, book I recommended to any researcher is called And, and it's called The Phenomenology of the End, and it's by Franco Biffo Berardi. Some of you may know Berardi's work, some of you don't. So it just so happens that these three are Italian, but I think I find them very, very interesting in terms of crossing the boundaries and what do we do and how we can look at a new way of critical forensics across architects, their works, and their own cultures. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Roger Corner, very much for the uh, first talk of the evening. And I would like to shortly introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Aino Niskanen, uh, who graduated in architecture from Helsinki University of Technology and was professor of history of architecture from 2007 to 2018 at Aalto University Helsinki. Her doctoral thesis uh, discussed careers and networks of Finnish architects, and she has written on uh, cooperative architecture in Finland, 
on Reima and Riley Pietilä on Alvar Aalto and on the, on the 1960s uh, Finnish architecture in, in general and the preservation of interiors. She has organized international conferences, been involved in international academic teaching projects and been a member of the board of several prestigious architecture associations like the Alvaralto Foundation and the Association Alvaralto en France. And today she will talk with the title Pietila in the Circle of Team X. Prego. <coughs> So uh, Roger Connor already spoke in an interesting way about Petila's Finnishness and internationalism. Can I get the first picture? Yes, thank you. At first glance, it would seem that there is little in common uh, between uh, Petila's unconventional architecture and the works of in the internationally oriented Team 10. Few of the members of Team 10 shared his interest in the study of form and morphological examinations of terrain shapes. Pietila uh, uh, sees himself, he has made a cut paper uh, uh, picture. He is the middle person who says that I am a theoretical person who study, uh, want, I want to study form, how form creates more form. So he defines himself, the person on the left is probably Alvar Aalto, already quite monumental, who says that I'm not interested in theory, I want to build. And the young guy in the picture uh, says that I'm only interested in uh, theory uh, of computers. So three di different attitudes. Petila took part in, on several occasions in the de debate uh, uh, of Team 10 between 1956 and 1981 of the meanings of images, the use of words and aesthetic expressions, ideas and architecture forms. That, uh, that discussion is generally considered uh, one of the most important contributions of the international group of Team 10. And do a, yeah. Petila was able to <coughs> join Siam in the 1950s, Siam uh, in many ways led by Le Corbusier. And uh, the core group of uh, Team 10 uh, then distanced itself from Siam, Siam from the rigid functionalism characteristic of the Charter of Athens. Here we see a moment when the sort of uh, the core group uh, uh, introduced the news of the death of Siam. You, you can see there is a, the sign of a cross. Uh, this group declared that the problem with housing, and now it's the housing after the Second World War, was not only quantitative but also qualitative. Uh, they urged planners to cooperate with sociologists and psychologists. New concepts such as neighborhood identity, user orientation, uh, aesthetics of adaptability were devised. Gradually, place and time and context were uh, standard terms. The network uh, provided a platform for developing urban planning ideas. Even though the participants uh, had diverse, at time conflicting views, they were all united uh, in their uh, interest of, uh, to experiment. And so was Pietile, as we heard. The inner circle, Petilas uh, in the garden of Aldo van Eyck in Rotterdam. The inner circle was made uh, of, team 10 was made up of Allison and Peter Smithson, Dutz, Jaap Bakema and Aldo van Eyck, George Candilis, Shadrach Woods and uh, Giancarlo de Carlo. Petila took part in Team 10 uh, meetings in 1956, 71, and 74, and he was uh, 
invited to the 1960s uh, gatherings. He was also uh, probably received an invitation to all meetings of the 1970s. Then he seemed to be close to the inner circle of Team 10. In fact, there were uh, plans uh, to have a meeting of Team 10 in inner building designed by Petile, meaning the Dipoli Student Union building. But uh, for some reason, that did not happen. And the last uh, Team 10 meeting was uh, 1977 in, the, in southern France. How did this group work? The meetings were of Team 10 were closed to outsiders. They did not produce any publicized theories or manifestos. So we have just to sort of uh, look at writings of different people and works, very different works by uh, different architects to understand what this was about. Participants presented their works at the gatherings. Not all designs were favorably received by other members. The meetings were characterized by spontaneous <coughs> socializing. They were often like family gatherings. In fact, the discussions frequently developed in heated family uh, quarrels. The death of Yap Bakema, an internal conflict, uh, then uh, ended uh, the <coughs> group <coughs> group 19, <coughs> sorry, 1981, but Petila remained friends with such members as Aldo van Eyck, George Kandilis, Paul Krishna Doshi, Indian Doshi, and also maintained contacts with the Carlo and the Smithsons. <coughs> One of the most important ideas about uh, Team 10 was a uh, large scale industrial building one of the central themes, the concept of open form, because this was a time when there was a great belief in growth. Uh, so the, we don't believe in growth at the same way, but that was, uh, that was uh, more or less 1960s. The concept of open form uh, <coughs> was presented, <coughs> and the concept of STEM and math <coughs> were introduced. So uh, the type of uh, gro growing forms that allow changes and growth. Uh, the uh, Berlin University, Freie uh, Universität is one of the best known uh, examples. It's a sort of densely built village which could grow to all kinds of directions, sorry. So Petila made uh, some <coughs> competition entries, uh, comb-like comb uh, entry for Zurich and other uh, uh, with stems. Uh, they, <coughs> the structural features, he did not win the competitions, but he uh, introduced the same ideas. <coughs> Ideas about urban context were much discussed in the 1960s. The notion of context, contextual, contextualism were part of the first critic of modernist practice. This third started in Italy in the 1950s in the circles of the Milanese journal Casabella Continuita by Ernesto Rogers. Ambiente was the word. And then, of course, uh, Aldo Rossi wrote L'Architettura della Città, 1966, and Vittorio Gregorotto, Il Territorio dell'Architettura. In, the, in, in English, the notion of ambiente is translated into context. And this means that space, no, uh, that history and uh, surroundings uh, were now uh, in place of the sort of abstract notions of Siam, which, which was mostly uh, uh, unhistorical. From the 1980s, the notion of genius Loki was introduced by the Norwegian architect and theorist Christian Norberg Schultz. The interest in genius Loki, the spirit of the place, 
led Pieti towards an interest in phenomenological philosophy, its interpretation in architecture. A philosopher once told me that it's almost impossible to interpret philosophical notions into built form, but nevertheless, it has been uh, uh, tried. Pietile argued that architecture is unavoidably tied to place. It grows on man-made local histor history and culture. And this was very different from the sort of universalism of the Siam. Somewhat later in the 1980s, Kenneth Frampton popular, popularized the notion of critical regionalism, which seems to belong to the same family of architecture thought of context, context genius loci, and phenomenology. There was a growing interest in the 1960s among the members of Team 10 in traditional historical cities, both European and Islamic, in the density and richness of meaning. Of course, Giancarlo de Carlo was reading historical Italian cities, famously in Urbino, and uh, in, uh, interpreting the sort of both the historical core and uh, grow with the sort of planning the new areas, like the new University of Urbino. Uh, from the group, George Candilis and Shadra Woods had studied the dwellings and building practices in Chad and Casablanca, Af Africa. Peter and Alison Smithson were studying traditional working class neighborhoods in London. So going to the local and studying the local. And uh, <coughs> some other examples, uh, Aldo van Eyck uh, giving, uh, making an interpretation of a sort of traditional Amsterdam townhouse in his uh, language of architecture. In 1968, the Petilas were invited to participate in an <coughs> sorry, invited competition for the design of a concept for the future of the city of Kuwait. Other invited uh, designers were George Candilis, Peter and, Peter and Alison Smithson, here, their ideas, and Lodovico Bel <coughs> How do space, space? Belgio Yoso from the BPR partnership. An international advisory committee from Kuwait defined that the building should demonstrate new Arabic architecture, have a character tailored to the local identity. The competitors were requested to spend three, four weeks in Kuwait to acquaint themselves with the country, its circumstances, and its lifestyle. So. Uh, the Alison and Peter uh, Smithson had a proposal for, for a greater plan. We can also see the sort of mat type uh, areas and a sort of mixture of modernism and I think uh, interpretation of Arabic ideas. So both the Pietilas and Smithsons were able to examine the local master plan of Kuwait and sought to find out how nature, climate, and culture had shaped local uh, living. The Pietilas were commissioned to design the Sif Palace. Sif means uh, shore in Arabic, that the area in Kuwait. On the far uh, right is a sort of um, Old Sif Palace, which was constructed in Islamic style, 1963, and then they designed two modern palaces, where 20 years earlier there had been a wharf and a harbor, the wharf for traditional teak ships, and uh, warehouses. So Pietila wanted to create an image of a traditional Kuwaiti waterfront. Their studies of the local culture included uh, inspiration, as Reima Pietila said, inspiration for local sources, the ancient Mesopotamian walls, like here up, like the sort of walls of Uruk. Uh, and um, fishermen's songs, 
the, the rhythm of the songs and the rhythm of camels in a caravan, not so easy maybe to interpret in architecture, but anyway. And uh, uh, the sort of colorful textiles which got an interpretation in the form of exterior panels. Local uh, uh, reinforced concrete was faced with uh, local lime blocks and colorful ceramics, which are somehow visible here. Uh, this, uh, the whole was completed 1982, but very little is left of the original today. I once tried to have a look and <laughs> was really sort of surprised everything had been chased. But in 1974, the Pietilas took part in an invited competition for the master plan of Deira Sea Cornish area in Dubai. And I think he, in this project, they got nearer the sort of interpretation of the uh, local culture uh, and climate. The sort of uh, Deira is a part of the Dubai city. <coughs> and uh, the competition should reflect both the historical and modern character of Dubai. The seafront. <coughs> It was a model of an island la lagoon for water traffic, and they. Uh, is there an extra snowy? Nothing happens. No. Okay. Look at them. Good. So they. Oh, sorry. Impossible. So uh, they created a wall towards the sort of big sea. So a protection wall and a small islands inside the wall. It was a five kilometer long sea wall to protect the city waterfront, leaving a lagoon of shallow waters behind it. And next to it was the old city of Kuwait. Uh, no, Dubai De Deira, sorry. The seawall was transformed in a chain of new urban islands of housing, commercial use, marinas for leisure activities, cultural congress center, museums, festival plazas, <coughs> the tower plaza with covered areas, sports area, peninsula, I think the sports area is probably here, and they studied the sort of uh, old uh, um, tissue of the old uh, uh, Dubai Deira old town, especially how, uh, how the density and scale of Arab cities, what it meant. Uh, the spaces in the old city were narrow alleys orientated towards sea wind. So the climate is, of course, very hot. So you need the shade, you need the sea winds, etc. So they studied the, this area and wanted to sort of uh, have the same type of ideas. You can see in the newer buildings uh, sort of the kind of... Uh, intake of air, the uh, little towers, uh, ventilation towers, which were traditional. So uh, from the model, ventilation towers, uh, arcades giving shade, etc. And then uh, housing with mosque and school and the sports stadium and still a university where we see the idea of same kind of math building like the sort of uh, uh, Berlin Freie University, the Berlin University, whereas the sort of student housing is a village-like area. So uh, that was a great interpretation, but the Pietila entry did not win the competition. 
Nevertheless, it aroused great interest. The archives contain, Pietila archives contains a letter from the member of the jury stating that the entry had commanded special attention for its great vision shown in understanding the scope of this very sensitive problem, uh, but sometimes economic demands blind our vision to greater considerations of life, said the chief town planner, so who was uh, uh, interested in consulting the Petilas further, showed an interest in further co cooperation, but in the end nothing came out of it. Uh, the Petilas had to declare that our small office cannot sort of uh, continue the work without a sort of bigger commission. So this, what could be learned from Dubai, I think here, Petile really gave an interpretation of history and uh, local culture. He had, as we all, uh, and we can see what happened there. Uh, 2007, I visited Dubai. It was a sort of cluster of small Manhattans, very heavy traffic. Of course, a lot of oil was used, so no problem with energy, the sort of fantasy islands, fantasy hotels, uh, and uh, there was only one small village or quarter of this uh, traditional coral, uh, sandstone, coral stone with those uh, cooling towers, but it was a sort of museum block, and that's all. I found it quite sad. Now to Petilas, other international contacts, there were many, but uh, that this uh, started really early with Siam in 1953. Ptah was the sort of Finnish group of Siam, and it started to uh, have its own journal, which uh, had a sort of French uh, contacts to the Carre Bleu. Uh, Venice Summer School, 1954. Petil also made uh, his uh, entry to the uh, Venice, Venice Biennale Pavilion. And then Team 10, of course, for many, many years. Petila in Finland also appointed to the foreign ministry. He wanted to be uh, an expert in international development work, I think, maybe Africa. but. Uh, I did not find any answer for this. And then he was a teacher in St. Louis and in Cornell University, so both in the United States during a period where he had almost no work in Finland. The uh, summer school on several occasions. And of course, then he had some works abroad, the Finnish embassy in New Delhi, the Kuwait Chief Palace, and many projects, many competition projects. The uh, Cornell uh, period, uh, which was, um, took place uh, during the spring term 1972 by the, the organizer was Oswald Matthias Unger, Ungers, a German architect, a member of Team 10. He invited Pietila to give a series of lectures at Cornell University. And it was interesting that his idea was that always two members of the Team 10 then were uh, at the same time overlapping. So uh, we can see that uh, yeah, Bakema had a longer period, and it was with several others, and Pietilas shorter period was more or less at the same time than Bakema. So there was a possibility to exchange ideas all the time, I think, rather beautiful. Pietila wrote, about, uh, held a seminar, and other one ideology that has been uh, preserved. According to him, cultural ideology must have priority over technological, economical, or social alternatives. 
He added that many architecture trends could serve as parallel options in the culture of our times. And he defined himself. Uh, for him, Finnish architecture meant the architecture of the northern shore, shore of the Baltic Sea. And he declared himself to be more a landscape architect and not so much a house architect. And he added that an architect should be an artist who helps the environment to transform into cultural morphic shapes that differ from the dominant technocultural models of his day and I think today in many, many ways. After this stint at Cornell, 1973, Petile began to, his teaching period as a professor in Oulu, Northern Finland. Then uh, there were the uh, workshop set by Giancarlo de Carlo at the University of Urbino, which was an expanded theme then. The program uh, was pl pluralistic. Uh, there was, uh, was a variety of interpretation of, and of context. And in response to reading of the environment, tentative designs and uh, rather than architecture objects. I think it's a sort of pop-up pop -up, uh, thing here by the Smiths and so sort of uh, decorations for a gate. Pietile uh, belonged to the group uh, of a planning group of uh, this uh, allowed workshops, De Carlo, of course, published many articles on Pietile works in the periodical Spazio e Societa. And uh, we don't know exactly. Somebody ought to maybe study more about these workshops. They fascinate me. Pietile worked on of his thoughts using illustrated poems often. And uh, we can see two. Uh, examples of these illustrations. And remember uh, the sort of Dutch historian Johan Hoetzinger, who analyzed play as a key element of human activity. He wrote his work Homo Ludens, The Playing Human, already 1938, saying that poetry is the other side of seriousness on a more primitive and original level in the region of dream, spell, ecstasy, and laughter to which children, animals, savages, and visionaries belong. And two examples, Aldofar Eich, who was near him, is playing with the idea that how the tree leaf is like a tree, the same shape, and he continues Tree is a tree leaf, and a leaf is a tree. House is a city, and city is a house, etc. Whereas Pietila's favorite <coughs> Finnish poet, Pavo Havikko, had a poem about a man who is drinking wine and uh, having the glass in his hand and thinking of maybe about a woman also at the same time. It's a play with forms, mixing the forms, mixing the images, and mixing the words. Also, uh, the Team 10 friends, the way they used pictures and maybe of comic strips, a new type of graphics, they were visible in the sort of Milan Biennale 1968. So some examples of their sort of colorful graphics by Shadra Woods and with Joachim Pfeiffer and another, the Smithsons, whatever wedding in the city is, the sort of joy of, uh, uh, of uh, telling about ideas in a sort of new graphic form. So uh, play and experimentation were important for Pietile. Here Riley, uh, Pietile, his wife, who was also an important cooperator for Reima. They are cutting pictures and the sort of helpers in the studio, um, cu cutting pictures, playing with the forms, uh, making exhibitions. So one can see that the playfulness is there. It was 
certainly fun to make these exhibitions. One was for the uh, Museum of Finnish Architecture and one was at home. And Riley Petrie remember that it was at the Christmas time we made a, uh, an exhibition at home. It was so beautiful. We had sort of maybe the music of Bach and people came and sort of took part into this. So experimental themes were important for them. One can remember that nonsense poetry and performance, which later became pop art, emerged as popular art forms, had emerged. One of the exhibitions, Space Garden, where uh, Petile wants to show a city. That it's a, actually a parking house on the left, and big ponds, and a sort of covered uh, area for walking, but a new type of visualizing these ideas, bold graphics. And uh, also archetypal animal figures were part, part of Petilas imaginary. Usually his office letter paper had pictures of an angling gat or a walking elephant, so uh, typically uh, the, the playfulness, this here is their family cat, Misukka, and he asked that why can't the sort of grid of a town plan be round as the sort of eyes of the Misukka cat are, and then another, uh, another illustration how notion becomes image and how it becomes idea, how sort of uh, abstract concepts get an illustration. So one can say that experimentalism, playfulness, and even humor were part of Reima Petra's strategy in collaboration, of course, with his wife, Riley. And uh, Aulis Blumstedt, a close friend, had defined himself that he's a hunter who is chasing a hare. But Petila saw himself as a fisherman, fishing. And uh, here is a sort of picture he dedicated to Aulis Blumstedt. He is a fisherman. The iceberg is, of course, visible. And then there are many, many, many layers uh, beneath it. There is a sea swarming with architecture phenomenon. The road is sinking, stretching from, from valid rational arguments, and to the left, that where is non-imagined, unexpressed, the extra logical, uh, and uh, and uh, w operative ideas things becoming informal qualities, etc. Uh, things that have no words, maybe, at all. So in this picture, he wanted to, to uh, explain what he's seeking. Also things that have no words, almost, but still using words and uh, images. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Aino Niskanen, for this also playful presentation. <laughs> it was very enjoyable. Um, and last, I would like to call forth uh, Professor Antonello Alici, who is, whose idea ha has made this uh, evening possible. And for as a short presentation, uh, I can tell you that um, Antonello Alici is Associate Professor of Architectural History at Polytechnic University of Marche, Ancona. And he's a member of the scientific committee of Vitruvian Studies Center in Fano, Marche, and also a member of the board of the International Confederation, Confederation of Architectural Museums. And a research fellow of, in architecture at the British School at Rome. His research interests deal with the history of landscape, city, and architecture, as well as with cultural heritage. He has lectured and published on 19th and 20th century city and architecture with a special 
focus on Nordic countries, Great Britain and Italy. He has been visiting professor at Aalto University in Helsinki and the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm. His researches on Finnish architecture go from national romanticism to Aino and Alvar Aalto to the young generation of the 21st century. And uh, among some of his recent publications on Finnish architecture are, for example, Aino e Alvar Aalto, Risonanze Italiane, de 2018, uh, contemporary Architecture Finland the, of, of 2010, and uh, La Sicilia di Alvarado uh, in, in the book Architetti in Viaggio, La Sicilia nello Sguardo di Altri, and, and, and many others. And currently he's also uh, researching uh, Reima Pietila, and, and we will hear about that with the title Pietila, Italian Connections. Prego. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I should go, no, okay. Um, it's already a bit late. I try to focus uh, on, on my paper, which is now going to, uh, to the Italian connection. Much has been said by the, the, the previous two speakers. And Roger Conner was saying, I never met Pietila. This is true. I'm just interested very much in this architecture. It's a very difficult topic. I want to start with the interest of Italian uh, culture on, uh, on Pietila, which is really uh, rather important. This is uh, uh, following, following up from, uh, from the big interest of Italian culture um, in Finland since the late uh, 30s when, uh, when Giuseppe Pagano, the director of Casabella, was traveling to a Nordic country and he got uh, acquainted with, uh, with um, Aino and Alvaralto. Uh, I want to talk about, uh, uh, I want to say, uh, Riley and Reima, because they were together, they were together in Italy, so it's very important to, to say uh, that uh, Riley was also a very important figure in this uh, context. Um, following the idea of how to map the research, we, we are, uh, I think, starting a new stage, which is uh, uh, trying to, with a safe distance, to re read uh, Reima Pietila. Where are the, the works of, of Riley and Reima? They are in the Museum of Finnish Architecture. They have uh, a wide archive, starting with Elian Salinen, and the complete drawings of Riley and Reima were donated, I think, uh, re uh, very recently and in 2006. And so we can, I, I use part of this material. But what else, if, I, if we speak about Italy, the Fondazione Bruno Zevi is also a place where you can find very well listed the letters with uh, many, many architects. And Bruno Zevi was, as already uh, said, was very interested in Rema Pietila. He was publishing his works uh, very, very rather early. The other important place is uh, Archivio Progetti in Ua Venice, where is the archive of Giancarlo De Carlo. Uh, the archive of Giancarlo De Carlo is one of the biggest, uh, very wide, and Giancarlo was one of the founding members of Team 10, which you already heard. And so through different pieces of this archive, you can see the, uh, you can find interesting material. Giancarlo De Carlo was starting the, uh, a, 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 a laboratory of architecture and urban design in 1967, 76, and then also started a magazine. So these uh, archives are also uh, searchable in Venice, but also in Modena, where is this uh, uh, other, um, uh, where is this other very important archive? We can search it in uh, on uh, on internet as well, but also. Uh, magazines, journals are very, very important. Le Carre Bleu has already uh, been uh, quoted. I will read something from Carre Bleu because it was started in 1958 as a very important paper. Um, I quote a free forum 
which opens the discussion on basic problems of architecture. Uh, in the construction of nature and in that of man, both form and content are equivalent and simultaneous, uh, simultaneous data. Familiarity, still a little quote, familiarity with the language of forms and knowledge of their symbolic um, value conditions any approach in architecture. Rema Pietila was in Le Carre Bleu since the beginning, was a founding member, but other magazines are Metron, where uh, Bruno Zevi is involved, and then Bruno Zevi stepped into the other magazine, which is L'Architettura Cronaca Storia. These are pages very, very relevant for our work, but going to Giancarlo De Carlo, and I will go back to quote, uh, and his wife, Giuliana Baracco, they started um, the Italian version of Espace et Société in 1975, but then the autonomous journal started Espace et Società in 78, and we will see that many Nordic architects were correspondent from uh, in Spazio e Società, as well as uh, Giancarlo De Carlo was correspondent in Le Carre Bleu since the beginning. The other journal, very, very important, is uh, Ilaud Journal uh, Yearbooks, International Laboratory of Architecture and Urban Design. You can see that the first number is in Urbino, 1978, and this was a place already mentioned by Aino Niska. This was a place very, very important. A, a very long summer school, one and a half month, with 10 schools from all over the world discussing the Italian city and uh, trying to find the new language of those times of which uh, um, Rema Pietila is writing a lot. So what is our aim is to reread his writings, to re, uh, try to re-understand his uh, thoughts, uh, his lectures, but also projects and buildings. I just propose a chronology, but I know already has put some other element in this chronology, starting from this uh, um, avant-garde group of young ar architects. The young generation was coming and destroying or declaring the death of Siam, which was the international community started by, by Le Corbusier and having a very important rigid rules. Young generation were put outside the door when the old generation was discussing and taking decisions. They were very quickly saying, you have to step out because we, don't, we are not interested anymore in your questions. And from 1959 in Otterlo, they declared the death and started this Team 10. And you see, Carre Bleu was starting the year before. Uh, and then, just to go, during the 60s, Team 10 was meeting in Stockholm. Ralph Erskine is also a very important uh, person, uh, British, but uh, in, in Sweden. And they were very good friends and meeting together several times. Team 10 was in Urbino in 1966, and then I told you already, Ilaud and Spazio and Società. Giancarlo De Carlo write a letter very important to to Rema Pietila, uh, remembering his first uh, meeting in 55, and then invites him to publish in this magazine. And in fact, there is a number 17 where Pietila is publishing his work. And he is also in a discussion with uh, Roger Conna, which was working with him in those days. And then Pietila becomes advisor from Finland, um, and they are in Siena in 86. I just go now briefly to quote uh, some, uh, some questions. Rema Pietila was a founding member of, uh, of Le Carre Bleu, as I said, and he was uh, writing a very important essay, the central essay on number one, the morphology of expressive form, and he was playing with different forms, the aggregated forms uh, and also the, the, the rigid forms, but also the, the, the more free forms. Um, he was uh, in this paper proposing, um, discussing the capacity of architecture to deal with spatial composition. I quote, until today architectural morphology has been essentially founded on the application of a, 
of a uh, body of rules pertaining to Euclidean geometry as the golden section. Um, it is curious how little um, regenerative and uh, fertilizing effect uh, the evolution of the mathematical sciences has been able to produce upon architectural morphology. Quite the opposite, in fact. Scholastic narrowness, heterogeneous and full of contradiction, in short, lifeless codes from which um, it long ago became impossible to desire any further profit. Nowadays, there exists a widely spread belief that the artist forms and finds exclusively um, with, with the aid of intuitive, uh, unanalyzable vision gradually assumed the character of popular philosophy. So he was proposing a completely different idea, not excluding Euclidean, but adding into mathematic schemes the intuitiveness. Uh, and he's also saying architectural composition includes applied psychological and physiological data. We are making the first step of uh, explicit interpretation of the morphological. Um, and he's uh, saying that um, the aim is to introduce uh, generalization system and order in a place. Each one of these qualities uh, is inseparably linked with the concept of the beautiful. But I want to say about, about connection that already in Le Carre Bleu, which was in French uh, mainly, but then English German version were copied in the, in the journal, you see a very important um, uh, list of names. Aulis Bloom said is there, Keio Petaya, Rema Pietila, and other, Kiosti Olander, but also uh, immediately Giancarlo De Carlo is there, and Arne Jakobsen and Sverre Fenn, and later um, Ralph Erskine is invited and others. And you see that uh, Ralph Erskine is uh, uh, immediately replying in the first, uh, suggesting a question uh, on what Pietila is uh, suggesting and saying. And here you see that more from Nordic countries are invited to be correspondent. So Le Carre Bleu should be a place where we, um, on, on, on which we, uh, we work a bit more. And, and Bruno Zevi, we told that he was very interested and following very closely. So, in the third number, in 59, they, uh, they propose the comment of Bruno Zevi, which was uh, uh, addressing Il Misterioso Quadrato Blu, contested, uh, contested uh, the idea of, uh, of this journal on, uh, on freedom. And then um, uh, Roger Conna told me that there is a long letter of reply by Pietila to Bruno Zevi, which I don't have here, probably is in the archive in uh, Helsinki. Yes, we have already seen this. This is the, 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 the time when these people meet, and these are some figures of this, uh, some protagonists of Team 10, which is not at all an organized team, is only uh, uh, friends, as already has been meeting regularly. And Rema Pietila, Ralph Erskine are there, not regular. Um, people meeting. Giancarlo De Carlo in this letter on 97 is reminding probably we met, I met Rema Pietila uh, in uh, 1955 in La Sarra. And I want to quote, during the meeting, Rema had shown some of, of his drawings, which, um, she, sorry, which he has explained by speaking in a low voice and looking out of the window towards the trees and meadows. And then in Siena, 1986, um, he said he was no longer as young and ardent as when I had met him, but certainly even more inspired than then. Describing his last project, it was clear from the way he spoke that he continued to be in his creative process and that he knew it would never end. 
no longer made a difference between his way of being in life and the way of consisting in the physical space of building. I think these uh, are really very important. And Bruno Zevi is publishing uh, the work of Pietila, you see, on, uh, in 64, also making some mistakes, but this is Casa dello Studente in Otaniemi, the nature designs, and then uh, the, the Dipoli, uh, very important, uh, which is, uh, uh, is, uh, is a test, is a trend, is a built sketch. Um, Roger Conna uh, comments on this book by Carmine Berincasa from the circle of, of Rema Pietila, uh, of Bruno Zevi. Uh, he said, really, this book is rather, rather simple, not really capturing deeply uh, Rema Pietila, but is the first, inter the first book completely wrote on Rema Pietila. So it was very important to have this book. And at the end, there is a paper by Rema Pietila, and uh, then it is comment in many magazines, also by Roger Conna. Um, I want to go um, again through letters. Uh, the, the history can be rewritten through letters. First of all, let me say that um, um, Bruno Zevi is commenting the, uh, commenting the, um, uh, the, 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 the works of Dipoli, saying, uh, there is not, uh, according to Zevi in Dipoli, the idea originates from the Neolithic myths of man's spatial and material experience. First experience, of an historical drawing, the, mytholo the mythologies of the Celts, Laps, and Finns derive from the spiritualism of nature, deeply emerge from this imaginary animation of nature. Um, but let's go to, back to Giancarlo De Carlo, who is uh, inviting Reima to write and to publish his work in this magazine, Spazio and Società. But also he was interested in Carre Bleu, saying, I saw in Le Carre Bleu a writing of yours that I found very interesting on order, disorder, and complexity. Would it be possible for you to develop this? And he did that with the help of uh, Roger Conna, because they were then making a dialogue trying to answer to this. But let me say that Le Carre Bleu published an entire number collecting the writings of uh, Rema Pietila and his, uh, and, his, uh, draw, and his project. I think this is a very important number where, um, where we can find um, a big part of his theory trying to uh, suggest the way of uh, having new generations of forms, new, a, a new um, aim for the, for the architect. And here is a list of questions, uh, always oppositions, form versus function, subcultural plurality versus technological, environment versus architecture, national versus international, unique versus universal, complexity, versus order, and this is what the, the chapter uh, which was uh, establishing a connection with Giancarlo De Carlo, who in one of the, in one of the allowed meetings was um, uh, suggesting the complexity of architecture and was uh, asking to all the professor participants to, uh, dis to discuss about what is complexity uh, in architectural language today. More letters from Giancarlo and from uh, Reima to Giancarlo when the, 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 arch the, the, the projects are, are uh, uh, published in his magazines. And you see in Spazio Società number 17, there is uh, a, a wide chapter on Riley and Reima Pietila. Uh, and Roger Conna is uh, uh, guiding this and saying, unsettled architecture. Dipoli and Herbanta. Uh, I, I should quote something. Um, uh, because there is a conversation between uh, um, Pietila and Conna, uh, and they say, 
uh, and the question is, Dipoli uh, remains uh, an unknown territory. Dipoli remains a torso, um, uh, uh, and, and it is an unsettled architecture, this is a question. Pietila replies, it is assumed that Dipoli is the most enigmatic design in Finnish architecture since the 50s. Only Norbert Schulz has analyzed it consistently. I still believe that my text, uh, literal morphology of 66, remains the best key to the ideas between Dipoli. Um, many of the best ideas were left as a half of that st of way st halfway stage. Dipoli was not realized completely as Pietila had designed. Interior, in the interior were made several changes, so he was disappointed. I continue quoting uh, Pietila. I hope that its principle of unsettled architecture could edge others to experiment more with form. Dipoli in its design has demonstrated that there are many special means as yet unexploited. Uh, its mission has been and will be in the future to infect with dangerous ideas. Hans Scharun Berlin Philharmonic is uh, also an example of this. And Alto Imatra Church is also a good example in this, of this of unsettled, uh, uh, of, of this uh, uh, way of, of searching forms and space. Um, an architect takes a risk, uh, Pietila says, to include in his composition elements of incongruence and discordance, elements which will never be harmonized with the whole, which will never be made into a synthesis. Dipoli, Dipoli's form was a draft to remain, however, uh, forever a sketch for a form. And this was quoted by Bruno Zevi. Um, and a little more, Dipoli accidentally implies by its design the building incongruent, incongruent of the 50s, the decade of the political Cold War, hysteria, and the space race. Their germinating ideas were, um, uh, were present from this era and the rational, cool 60s killed them. Um, about complexity, order versus complexity in Dipoli, uh, Pietila answered to Roger Conna, I search toward a new expression in its, uh, of this newer culture, beginning with the widest ideas of the, mod of the modernist principles of comprehensiveness. The inclusion of all uh, imaginable and thinkable aspects. Dipoli was a counterpart to the National Romantic Poly Building in Helsinki. It was erected in the midst of the Finnish forest in much the same way as it would be um, erected in the middle of the rather English landscape of the Alto Campus in Otaniemi. It had to be designed in some way to follow my generation, though, and not that of Alto. And then here, letter from Reima, when he accepted to be a correspondent for Spazio and Società. And then again, a very important this, uh, paper for the future. What is the future of architecture? What is the future responsibility of architecture? In the Warsaw Congress of, of uh, uh, International Union of Architects, Rema Pietila is addressing this question. Third generation, a cultural design synthesis. So what we leave to the future generation? 80s are very, were very critical years. We know it very well. And he wanted to suggest a new starting point uh, from this third generation. And he's suggesting a new function, a cultural one, urbanism of the super number, communicative design forms uh, or language rules of architecture, new profile of the future, a cultural design synthesis. So it is uh, searching more and more to provocate and to suggest a way. And this letter to Giancarlo De Carlo, which is also explained this uh, intricate 
a connection between generations is then published in Spazio Società. I close with uh, in a number of uh, uh, Elaud magazine, which uh, is when Reima and Riley were in, in Siena, uh, not in Urbino, but in Siena in uh, 1986. Uh, uh, he published uh, uh, three projects, three design options. And it's very important to just read what Pietila is uh, um, proposing with three key projects. Three buildings, three design options. The three buildings are uh, Mezzo Tampere City Library, Finnish Embassy in Delhi, and Presidential Residence at Mantuniemi. Uh, and uh, he is suggesting in this, uh, uh, in this paper, um, uh, the, the first one, the, the, the Mezzo Tampere Library, is, uh, shows the concept of design for a cultural region. Uh, Finnish Embassy in Delhi is for him a geomorphic image of Finland. He studied, um, um, he, he says, uh, I quote, the semi-Arctic Finnish landscape is kind of landscape sculpture. Can a Nordic building live in the vegetal nature of the South? doing so with its characteristic lines and rhythmic sequences, the New Delhi case leads me to answer affirmatively. If the design is in harmony with birch trees, it also will be um, uh, so with neem trees. Residential, presidential palace of Mantuniemi is uh, uh, quoted as oneness of sight and nature. And of course, here he plays a lot, very important with the, with the nature, with the coastline, with Finnish uh, architecture of, of uh, forest and water. How can architecture become contextual with nature? How can geomorphological processes inspire modern architecture design? These are still very open questions for us. Um, and. Uh, I want also to say, and this is uh, some research still to, to do, Pietila was very interested in the Arctic landscape and Arctic architecture. And the same thing is uh, by Ralph Erskine, who in the first part of his life, when he moved to Sweden, was designing a lot for Arctic landscape. Um, I close now, really, with uh, the final, with the final collection of, of, uh, of uh, sketches uh, in, the same, in the same magazine for Italian public. Um, and, and I know has already explained how Aulis Blomstedt was important. In this uh, uh, final page, he is uh, uh, saying natural design morphology uh, and says, uh, uh, talks about uh, uh, um, Aulis Blomstedt, one of the leading figures in Finnish architecture in the 50s said that architecture is like an iceberg. Its visible part is only a fragment compared with the invisible one. Here I have tried to illustrate that large unseen realm. We usually work with formal and formulated issues with conceptual standard. We eliminate ideas of informal or gestaltic quality, but shouldn't we also be working with the latter kind of elements. And uh, Bruno Zevi, when Pietila died, uh, was uh, making a very little, little in l'espresso, because he has also a, a, a page in l'espresso. So it was, say, architettura, uh, ritorno al medioevo, questa opera volta le spalle al XX secolo e guarda verso il decimo following what is what quoting uh, uh, already on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, on Pietila architecture during a couple of decades before. Thank you.